I want to uh, welcome you back to session two of season two. I've been watching television here. Season two of the Idea to Impact Forum. Um, if you're new to Idea to Impact, you'll find that this forum has been designed really to um, begin a dialogue here on campus about the innovation process and moving ideas for new products, processes, and services out beyond our campus so it may do greater good for both us, the university, the region, and beyond. Um, what I have found in the last couple of years is that this innovation culture has become critically important to the leaders at the highest level here in North Carolina. Um, Governor McCrory has established um, an initiative called Innovation to Jobs. It's a, a council, I2J council, and they're um, charged with evaluating our um, culture here within the state and improving the climate so we can do better as a state in creating new, um, new businesses, new jobs, new revenue for the state. Um, partnering with that is an, another council called the uh, University Innovation Council that has really just begun. And they're um, charged with looking at opportunities for building and um, enhancing this innovation culture on our college campuses, both public and private. So you can clearly see that this, this whole innovation culture and the results from it are very important to, um, to the folks here that are running our state. Now, our first session for Idea to Impact, um, we, we brought some institutional and state leaders here and we talked about the importance of an innovation ecosystem. And then we had an opportunity to sort of exercise our own creative juices, if you will, and come up with ideas for maybe a new product. Um, it, it went phenomenally well, and I actually had to ask people to leave because they, they, the program was over, and, um, and Aramark wanted to close down. So it, it went very, very well. Um, Mother Nature wasn't very cooperative with us for our second session. Um, where we were going to basically look at ideas and try to evaluate them more critically. Um, sometimes we say we want to break them. Because if we're not going to break an idea, somebody else is. So let's do it before we invest a lot of time and resources into that. Now, as I said, Mother Nature wasn't very cooperative. We weren't able to have that program. But today's session is talking about the um, resources we need to tap into to help us do these evaluations. So I think they, they really mold together very well, and I think it will be pretty seamless. I don't think you're going to be out anything by us jumping into session three. So um, I've, I've written down here the phrase, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, doesn't work. <laughs> doesn't work in this environment because we do need to try to break things and find out where the gaps are and where we might be able to fill them in. Now, I hope that you will share my enthusiasm for our panel here today um, because we've, we've got a great panel and, and they're very um, appropriate for our conversation in, in both topic areas. Facilitating our conversation is um, Ted Morris, Associate Vice Chancellor for Innovation and Economic Development here at ECU. Next to Ted, we have um, Sharon Painter, and Sharon, I'm going to try to get all your titles here, and, and if I miss them, forgive me. Director of the Office of Public Service and Community Relations, Director of the Engagement Scholars Outreach Academy, EOSA and Associate Professor of Political Science. Next to Sharon, we have uh, Nicole Schrubrock. And Nicole is Director of Technology Development with the Small Business Technology Development Center. Um, and she's housed at the central office in Raleigh, but is a good friend of ECU, and we see her quite frequently. And then rounding out our program, I'm very excited to have with us Brad Griffin, who is the Vice President of Product Development and Creative Services for Practican, 
Practicon, which is a nationally known dental practice consulting and product um, development company that's actually located right here in Greenville. Um, there's a bit more in your programs. I've got some bios written for each of those, so to save time, I, I thought we'd just um, write it down and, and have that work for you. Now, um, before we begin, begin, let me just tell you about the format for today. Ted's going to facilitate um, the discussion for about 30 minutes, and then immediately following, we're going to have an opportunity for Q&A. You'll notice on your tables, there should be some index cards um, and pencils, so please um, take advantage of those and write your questions on the cards. And when it is time for Q&A, we'll have our um, staff collect those cards. Carlisle, you want to raise your hand? and. Diana, they will collect your cards and hand them to me and we'll read them off. And we do that because we're going to have this the whole program planned or uh, videotaped and we want to make sure that the questions are, are heard and understood. Um, immediately following q and I hope that you'll stay around if you're able because we're going to work on some, um, some more of these small group exercises much like we did the last time. So um, we've got some facilitators that are going to facilitate discussions at each of the tables. And um, I think it will be a really engaging thing and it will help you begin to start breaking your ideas, if you will. So if you're able, please um, stay for that discussion. So the last housekeeping rule is, is yes, lunch is provided. Help yourself, get up, move around the room all you like and serve yourself. Um, just avoid walking in front of the cameras, if you will. Um, the program is videotaped. None of you will be filmed, so you're safe there. And um, I can't think of anything else to say. So I think it might be best if I just turn it over to Ted and the team and let them get started. Thank you all for being here. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for being here. We appreciate it very much. And many thanks to our panel today. It's uh, intended to be, as Marty said, a casual conversation. You're free to move about your chair over the course of this discussion and, and relax accordingly. But thank you for each of you bringing your unique perspective to, uh, to what we'd like to chat about. I think Marty gave us a, a, a great introduction. Uh, as she described at our previous idea to impact, we've talked a lot about how do you elevate a culture where creativity and innovative ideas and divergent and breakthrough thinking becomes more of a norm uh, than an outlier. And, and now, you know, I think today we'd really like to focus on what happens next. Um, how do you take a, an idea? How do you pressure test it? How do you, you know, as she said, make it fail as quickly as possible so you can begin to add value to it as quickly as possible? How do you build a value proposition? around that and most importantly how do you go from that sort of creative dreamer stage if you will to that execution and entrepreneurial stage because as Marty's indicated uh, ECU is very interested in having this culture of innovation and entrepreneurship not only spread throughout every corner of our campus but ultimately spill out into the surrounding community and region. So we had a chance to visit before today a bit and we, we, we talked about a, a framework that might help guide us in this discussion, um, those key words from what we would call design thinking. Uh, thinking about ideas, are they desirable, are they feasible, are they sustainable? And I know you all bring a, bring a lot to that topic. So I'd like to start with desirable uh, and frame that a bit and then just have each of you for a few minutes kind of jump in as, as you see fit and, and add on to each other's comments. But uh, in general terms, you know, a lot, when we talk about desirability, we're oftentimes focusing on the problem, uh, certainly very specifically on the user that has that problem and, and how to best understand that. And some of you are coming at this from an industrial perspective, from a, from a consulting perspective, possibly from a community or even faculty perspective. Talk to us a bit about that process of identifying the user and really beginning to understand what the problem is for them. I think I'll jump right, in, yeah. I'll just because I'm sitting close <clears throat> to Ted. Um, I think you um, first have to learn how to listen um, to what the folks in the other organizations or other um, parts of the industry are interested in doing and where they see the needs and the gaps. So um, from a community perspective, if we're talking about building an innovation to address a problem, to really understand how that um, group of people who are affected by that problem are um, articulating it, um, what they see as um, th the ways that they may be using it in the future, um, what the, their issues are with the existing list of um, tools or, or 
innovations that are available to them. So I, I think the first part for me would be as you're addressing and listening to the problem is to really um, take the time to understand who that user group is. Fair enough. And uh, actually very interesting because I guess in, in city planning there can be real problems um, that arise and you try to find a solution. Um, often in, in the life sciences um, uh, people tend to create problems or think they have a problem where there is actually no problem. Um, so one of the exercises to really do very early on is like do we really solve a problem? I mean do we need a next mousetrap? How many mice are there to catch? <laughs> and again mm -hmm. what is the customer of this mousetrap? Um, so it's, it's very interesting to, to define a problem and not to create a problem. Um, so I was Yeah, um, the question would be, is it a problem worth solving? Yeah. yeah in three <laughs> words. Um, and then, you know, once you've got this bank of ideas, we talk about listening to the customer and we call that VOC, voice of customer. Mm -hmm. You know, and so you've got to find out um, from your, your customers who would be hopefully buyers, um, you know, is this a problem we're solving and, you know, are we solving it the right way? Um, you know, what are the alternatives to this product? You know, how is it done before? You know, ask those kinds of questions. So it sounds like, I like yeah. that term, the voice of the customer, because mm -hmm. it, what that seems to imply is a lot of effort put into empathizing with that yeah. potential user. And, and you touched on that a bit too, right? Um, not, not just hearing them, but truly listening to the point of empathy where mm -hmm. you can both characterize and quantify their need. And I, you all also mentioned gaps. Um, and I assume those gaps are not only in, in terms of what's available, but in the case of you know a, an actual uh, industrial firm, in terms of mm -hmm. the, the the available space within the intellectual property landscape mm -hmm. potentially. So that yeah, we'll gather that information at trade shows, um, which is a great chance to talk to a lot of customers in one place. Um, we do surveys, um, you know, we visit customers, but you really got to put your own your own opinions aside and really listen, like Sharon talked about. Mm -hmm. I think too from a faculty perspective, you're trained to see where are the gaps in the literature, where can I feed new information into my discipline or my field. Mm -hmm. So applying that skill set to addressing an applied issue in the community or, or in an industry is very similar to the way that you're trained as a faculty member or a researcher. Is it fair to say though that while the process is very similar, the answer may differ? depending on the perspective. So a gap in the literature may not translate to a gap in the marketplace. Because I seem to hear what Brad saying is, it has to be a problem worth solving, but that answer to whether or not it's worth solving also depends on who you are in attempting to provide the solution. Is that fair? Yeah, I mean, can you market it? I mean, you might have a great solution, you know, but you have no way of selling it or, you know, getting it to the, to the buyer. Mm -hmm. So really, before you spend a penny, you kind of need to think about how you're going to market it, you know, sell it. But, um, yeah, that would come next. As a, I mean, as a consultant, I imagine all the time you encounter and have discussions with folks. Where it might be a real problem. It ha might have market potential, but it's really not within their core competency to potentially solve it. Uh, sure, sure. And I, I think um, uh, that's when the village comes to, into place where you really see um, if I can't have really the abilities to solve these problems, um, do I have a network of, of consultants or people that have can help me in, in really solving this problem uh, also in a, in a cost efficient way. I guess um, uh, very early on it's important to, to realize that uh, it needs some funds to solve problems and to of course keep those funds as minimum as, as, as possible. Um, so yeah, and, and those gaps always exist, um, but it need to be researched very well um, in how far can these gaps actually be, be filled, but then how costly is it and how time efficient can it be. So yes, in, in our area, when we consult to clients, um, these are the questions that we ask our clients. Wonderful. Well, I think you provide us with the perfect segue to think about feasibility, uh, which typically we would, we would ask ourselves, you know, is, is it within the bounds of current science and technology and, and capabilities to create the solution? Um, maybe to kick that off, though, let's not leave our former topic too far behind. For each of you, I mean, maybe from a faculty perspective or, or administrative or consultant or, or business, where do you primarily go 
to begin that process of breaking the idea. Is that internal to your company? And, and when and how do you avail yourself from other folks in the village, so to speak, um, at the appropriate times? Yeah, I can start, I guess. Um, we have a process that's well known called StageGate. Okay. And you can Google that and there's a full blown, you know, method to that. But it's, think of it as a funnel and you get a lot of products in the front and you know, at the end come a fraction of those products. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the ones that don't get broken are the ones that make it all the way to launch. But um, yeah, I mean, the, the kind of questions you ask at the front are feasibility questions. You know, can it be manufactured? Does, does it defy gravity? Does it defy laws of physics? Um, you know, do we have the resources, you know, internally to make it, or can we find those resources? Um, are there regulations that prevent that? You know, in, in our case we have to ask ourselves if it's a medical device that is really outside of our ability to get through the system you know class one is pretty easy but class two class three probably more than we can handle mm -hmm. and those kinds of questions you know there's patent issues you know are you fighting a existing patent those kinds of things so you're, you've got a good regimented internal process but you're, yeah. you're reaching out to your patent attorneys and yeah I mean it's a list of questions that you ask at each stage gotcha um, and the closer you get to the end the questions get harder yeah like what's the margin the return on investment mm -hmm. those kinds of things sounds like you're developing though a lot of answers that along the way are helping craft not only the value proposition that will drive the marketing mm -hmm. but yes. some of the business planning as well that would it yes. take to execute is that fair to say right okay. and the more you do it you know the more experience you have so mm -hmm. to learn behavior yeah learn from mistakes so I think in the university environment you do very similar things mm -hmm. um, but you also have to think about is it mission critical um, does this help us address these strategic initiatives that we we have laid out as a campus um, as important for us um, and also um, as we're embarking in this new partnership are we creating projects that are going to be beneficial for both us and our community partners mm -hmm. um, and, and that for ECU gets back to the mission critical piece Agreed. I mean, you and I both do that every day, right? I mean, mm -hmm. trying to um, re reach out to the other people in the ecosystem from an administrative perspective to, to understand uh, maybe where some of the challenges are. I think, too, f even for individual faculty in their own discipline, right, we would suggest reaching across disciplines, mm -hmm. you know, for that third party vantage point, uh, mm -hmm. maybe to get a fresh look at things as they try and break it. Nicole, thoughts on that? Yes, um, so very similar to Brett, um, we do also a very thorough, um, we create a business plan, part of this business plan is a market analysis and a patent landscape. Um, and these are two very important components, um, not only to position yourself and your product, but also um, it's to understand the path that is necessary to commercialize your product. Um, if it's intellectually property based, um, there are certain regulations, FDA regulations, regulatory regulations. So if this is a, a small molecule that has to go through a certain approval process, there are similar molecules that went through a similar approval process. So uh, having a very thorough market analysis and not only, um, uh, let's say, a, a, a federal one but a uh, worldwide um, uh, other countries included that really guides us as consultant okay these are the steps that our inventor has to overcome to get to market yet it's not as overwhelming as it seems because many people have done similar uh, steps um, before and, and can advise and I think there again the advice of others comes is very helpful and, and reaching out understanding the market and then uh, very similar to Brad um, a patent landscape has this been done before how non-obvious is it how unique is it how useful is it is it a trademark um, uh, issue or is it a copyright issue so uh, the, these are um, it's almost we benefit the most if the client can answer its own questions um, and our role is it to really lead the client to ask those questions to themselves.
Mm -hmm. Is it fair we want to leave our audience with an, with an understanding? There are a lot of established processes for coming yeah, at right. these problems. I mean, you've got things like StageGate, you've mm -hmm. got the models that Nicole's just described. I mean, e even in academia, we have peer review, right? I mean, there's, there's a process there. We do a lot of work, again, with human-centered design thinking and value proposition design and business model canvassing. I mean, there are many, many, you know, well, designed succinct models out there with many common examples of companies and organizations we all know and how they were served through those processes that I don't think anyone should uh, should fail to avail themselves of, of knowing that those tools are available and free many times and yeah. can produce quick results mm -hmm. when used properly. Mm -hmm. Is that a fair statement? Sure. Mm -hmm. Well, I wanted to leave the, the largest block of our time to really get into that broader category. So we've, we've talked a bit about, it, it, is it a problem worth solving? Is it desirable? Is there a user out there with a need? We've talked about some strategies to really hone down into answering the questions of, is it feasible? And in answering those questions, really developing the data we need to drive potentially our marketing and our business planning. Let's talk about sustainability. We've had a creative idea. We've, we've been innovative. We had a passion for action. We, we may even be uh, somewhat entrepreneurial. And we're up and running. But there's a lot of issues about you know, taking a product to market, for example, or a solution to the street. Mm -hmm about sustainability and uh, you know there are a lot of dimensions to sustainability from legal to environmental to financial thoughts on that how best how best to approach that for the person who's got a foot they're willing to stick into the pond I mean uh one of the, the key issues is always to have a customer. Mm -hmm. I think as soon as you have the first customer for the product that is invented or is reinvented, mm -hmm. then it uh, makes, uh, I think, the commercialization process much easier. Um, so um, one advice is to really early on find a consumer, find someone that is willing to pay for your product. Um, uh, recently I talked to one client and said, yeah, I'm, I'm giving out uh, my product um, uh, to do proof of concept for free for um, uh, surgeons to use it or, or for other medical personnel to use it and they can test it and see if they like it. I'm like, maybe if you were to find some consumer who want to pay for this product and is it only 10, 30, 50 dollars it's much better to be in front of investors and say look someone paid for my product mm -hmm. instead of I had gotten it for free um, so positioning your product so somebody would pay for it so the value proposition we, we give to our clients mm -hmm. I think you're right. I think, I think it is oftentimes confused the difference between demonstrating the function and proving the concept that someone will pay for the value being exchanged. It's easy to confuse those. Yeah, when, when I think of sustainability, I think I can sell one, but can I sell a thousand or ten thousand yeah. know, or a million? And um, you've got those early adopters, but it, it's got to you know, penetrate the market deeper than that to really return an investment. Um, and you know, we'll kill a product if it's not, we deal with a square inch analysis where things have to pay for their space and our marketing materials. And if it's not a positive number after a certain time period, it's out, you know. Mm -hmm. um, we give it our best shot, but if after two or three years it's not making money, you know, we move on to the next product. And part of that, you know, just is it priced well? Does it deliver value? Does it do what it's supposed to do? All those kinds of things. And um, when you go into a, a project, make sure you've got enough money to get past those early hurdles. You know, we, we developed a product once that got off to a great start, but it developed a battery contact issue, mm -hmm. and we really didn't have the resources to come out with a, a, a second version of this. And so it died because of the quality issue, and when all it really needed was another, you know, just improvement. Um, so think about that. You know, don't spend all your money on the first generation you know, leave a little bit in, in reserve for improvements. Um, That's a great yeah, point. Yeah, I mean, sustainability, is it, is it going to sell? Mm -hmm. you know? I think about sustainability and, and I also consider um, things like, am I going to address the problem so well that I'm going to run out of people to buy it? Um, and am I going to have that returning customer, that person who mm -hmm. says, I continue to have this issue that I, I mm -hmm. need to have addressed. Um, mm -hmm. So really having an ear to the ground, 
to see how well it's performing and, and are we able to um, continue to bring those people back to look at w whether or not this yeah. is a viable product right. for the long run. I'd love to run out of customers. That would be great. <laughs> Everybody bought one. But you know, part of that might be sharing. You know, it's always nicer when your product has a disposability factor because it does bring back repeat business, mm -hmm. yeah. um, as opposed to them ever only needing one. You know. Mm -hmm. oh, so what we see a lot um, since we deal with very early commercialization efforts is: um, is it sustainable in a manufacturing, in a production state? One mm -hmm. thing is to have it in a laboratory um, in 10 milliliters, like a cup full of reagent works great, but can we do this in one gallon, in 50 gallon, in 100 gallons? And I think the earlier the, the faculty realize um, scale-up issues or address the scale-up issues, manufacturing issues, uh, the better. Um, again, there's always a solution and has to be found um, and, it, and therefore it can be sustained. If, if this is not possible, if the technology is too complex, then uh, again, where is, is the value in, in, in commercializing this product? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. True. Yeah. So I think you could take an even broader interpretation on sustainability. Um, is there going to be any sort of political thing that starts to occur to make it less attractive, yeah. right? So Cultural is there work. environmental mm -hmm. effects of mm -hmm. having to produce mm -hmm. it at the price point you right. need to um, in the ma manufacturing environment? Or are there cultural issues mm -hmm. that we didn't anticipate um, yeah. that are, are making us have yeah. to rethink yeah. the product? That's where you kind of need a crystal ball, but <laughs> you know, larger trends just, you know, in the market, you know, who knew you know, corded phones would be gone, or um, maps, you know, who needs maps anymore? I mean, y you do kind of have to definitely keep your periscope up and make sure there's nothing down the road that's going to doom your, your product. Um, you know, some trend that's going to replace it with a new technology. You know, that, that's hard to do, but that comes from reading and studying and, you know, just really being, uh, knowing your market, you know. When I think what too what you all are highlighting, you really need to be clear, not just, I mean, we started off, you need to be clear about the problem, you need to be clear about the user, but the, at the back end, you need to be very clear about what business you're in. There's a big difference between seeking to sell a product in perpetuity, right, for as long a life cycle as it can have, versus mm -hmm. trying to solve a problem in a community that you hope the solution has an end because the problem is cured once and for all. Many of them aren't, but many of them you, you do try and develop that one-time solution that uh, cultural change then makes unnecessary to repeat. So I think it's very important to be clear about what the end game is, separate from the user and separate from the problem, from your own perspective. But I know we're short on time, and I, I, one topic just has to be revisited, and that's this issue of scale-up. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the challenges of, you know, reserve some resources. Don't bet it all on that first incarnation. Nicole, I think you hit it very well. It, there's a big difference from the 12-ounce can to the one-gallon and the 50-gallon mm -hmm. drum. And, you know, you're properly uh, talking about the fact that, you know, when you start to scale things in a social context, politics and culture may take turns that you don't necessarily anticipate it, and I've often heard it said and this is not to contradict your point it is great to have that first paying customer but many times that's when your real challenges start <laughs> yeah and it's around because you've got the high class problem of needing to scale up yeah in that content actually um, a mentor of mine always said it's good to have challenges I mean as long as you have those means you're actively working on a problem mm -hmm. that you try to solve so whenever there is a challenge is good because you try to solve it and you go to the next one and next one so um, uh, challenges is actually I'm a I, we thrive on those um, because that's what consultants do, <laughs> solve <laughs> problems. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. But to your point, you need to expect that, right? Correct. The, Correct. The first sale is not the end oh. of the line, it's the start of many challenges to come. Yeah, I mean, you have to, going into it, you have to have a very, you know, long-term commitment, unless your intention is to develop it and sell it, mm -hmm. because scaling up, you know, brings about, you know, all kinds of different financial issues, you know, inventory issues, space issues. You know, if you're making it in your garage, you know, just where are you going to go to next? You know, mm -hmm. think about, you know, when I need a building, how's that going to work out? Um, you know, think about, do I need to take this to a, a different manufacturing source to get costs down? You know, because I'm making it right now, next door, you know. Um, so yeah, you got to think about all those kinds of things. 
thoughts yeah. on the social context? It's, it's a little, little different issue when it comes to scale up. Yeah, it is. Um, I, I would probably say that w we need to go back to basics on the social context and, and really be sure that we're continuing to do innovation by listening to what the people in the communities are saying about um, scaling this up. Um, mm -hmm. Is it resonating with them? So I, I guess my message is pretty consistent across the questions. Um, it is to know who you are attempting to address an innovation toward, whether it is um, something that is becoming valuable to them and understanding what that value proposition is about. Fair enough. Well, you all have been very, very helpful and we greatly appreciate it. Let's, let's end on this note. Our, our theme today is, in part, where do you go for help in the community to, to help move this creative idea through innovation uh, into execution, into the marketplace? Mm -hmm. uh, if you have one last suggestion for folks, or, or piece of advice, or a piece of encouragement, what would you leave them with? Yeah, well, don't give up, but in our case, we know the dental market, so I enjoy calls from innovators within the dentist dentist field and I try to help them move their invention along so if you got something try to find a company or an expert in that field mm -hmm. and just tug on them you know see if they can help you point you in the right directions give you advice um, that would be my opinion. fair enough yeah and yeah. in addition to that uh, once you find this expert find actually um, another team members that are not experts or experts in other fields find experts in accounting in marketing mm -hmm. in commercialization um, i think product specific experts so um coming back to our previous i think the the bigger the company or the product gets and it gets sold very far, um, the more diverse the structure of the company becomes. Um, meaning, for example, not sure how much Bill Jobs really saw his iPhone at the end. Um, uh, so you really become very removed for your product the further you develop it. And you have to be aware of it if you are the innovator, that it won't be your invention that it will be so changed throughout the course of time and you have to let it go and let it go its way. Great point. I, th I think um, as much as an academic I hate the rejection that comes with peer review. Um, <laughs> that, that lesson is really important um, to be able to see what happens when it is broken mm -hmm. and what sorts of things that you can do with it when you start to put it back together. Um, whether that is an innovation or an idea that's aimed at a community, I, I think breaking it is very valuable. Well, at the heart of all your advice is, you know, that humility to keep going, seek the assistance of others, and, you know, as Brad pointed out, sometimes you need to cut your losses and retool and try it another way. Mm -hmm. well. well, thank you all very much. Mm -hmm. We greatly appreciate your time. We appreciate you being here, and I uh, hope you'll be able to stay around here for a while as we move into our next phase of the afternoon. That's thank you. Too early. We talked about problem mm -hmm. and solution. Can you have a solution that's too early? Yes. I mean, if, if the customer is not educated about the need for the solution, um, you better be prepared to educate them um, because you're too early. Mm -hmm. You know. So, innovations by definition are, you know are unused at the point they're introduced, but unless it's an iteration of another product. So in some respects, everything is too early, but y you've got to kind of find that sweet spot where the, the education is there, but um, the products are not, you know, I guess. I think there's some risk, right? When you're too early, you're out there and you're ahead of the curve, but you may not have had the opportunity to really think on um, and simmer your idea to the point that you would want it to be. Um, when that happens, people can hear the idea and they latch on to that early thing and you can't get them moved past that. My husband accuses me often of being a, um, a out loud processor, so I'll just say things, right? And, 
and try to figure it out with him. That, I don't think that's always the best strategy in this environment. I guess you need to know who your customer is really well before you start down that path. Although I have to say I'm, uh, I'm maybe very idea happy. <laughs> I think ideas are never a bad thing. It's like there's not such a thing as a wrong question. Or, um, however, it needs to be defined uh, where this idea is going. Is it a research publication? Is it something you're teaching your kids not to do? Is it something you want to commercialize? So I, I think uh, an idea always needs to be listened to, but then it needs to very quickly be defined where this idea is going. And, and I think and that's, that's where experts come into, into play who can listen and then define whether this is uh, an idea to publish or to commercialize. Mm -hmm. Very good. Sharon, I think this one's laid out for you, but the others can chime in as they'd like. But not all products and innovations lead to large profits, or but sometimes they address sort of a societal issue or societal problem. So how does this factor into a feasibility assessment, and how do you balance the portfolio of products with high profit potential versus low profit? So I think that's a good question for the group. Yeah. Um, I think you have to know what the grand challenge is, what the societal need is, and if you are um, building a product to address that, um, the profit margin may not be the most important thing because what you're really doing is, for example, increasing awareness of the value of preventative health care or um, screenings for breast cancer. Um, so th thinking about wh what's the actual motivating factor that's underlying the thing before you may be the way that you go about addressing that. I think too, per our previous conversation, you have to know what business, quote unquote, you're trying to be in. Mm -hmm. Because then that's going to determine what, what, through which type of business model will you evaluate the relative importance of impact versus profit and factor all that into sustainability. I have one that I think is going to be a lot of fun. At what point do you give up on an idea? <laughs> well, very um, numerically, I can say <laughs> we expect things to pay for themselves in three years. Yeah. So a product should generally return, start to see a return on investment in three years. Um, in, in our business, it probably takes longer for you know, some industries you know, power industries to get that kind of return, but um, that's what we look for. Yeah, I think unfortunately there isn't really no golden bullet on answering this question. Um, what we suggest our clients are generally, it's good when the clients have an own financial input in their business, um, it's that motivates them more, um, but it just goes to a certain extent. You, you, but sometimes you don't want to jeopardize your family, your mortgage, whatever, your marriage, whatever it is, to make this business work. I mean, I think you have to find the balance, but I, I guess there is, as I said, no, no real good answer to this. When it's hard to get people to go to the meeting to talk about it, I think you really have to think about giving <laughs> up on that. Yeah, I mean, mine's a combination of all. If it doesn't get you out of bed in the morning, it's probably time to let it go. Yeah. Do you see high growth opportunities outside of the technology field, and if so, where? Oh, absolutely. You know, we do a lot of uh, work with, with younger students on this whole creative process and, and entrepreneurship. And, uh, you know, many times their, their ideas, um, they, they, they may approach it from a high tech perspective thinking that that's what's needed to, to actually execute. And it turns out there's a much more simple and elegant solution. Um, they are very, very in tune with their cohorts as users. And many times, you know, they'll uh, think of things that could be tremendous fads, if you will. And that there's nothing, nothing wrong with a great fad uh, from either an economic or cultural perspective from time to time. So um, I, I think, you know, you can look at it from a variety of ways, absolutely. We just took a team of students to compete in a, a statewide competition on social entrepreneurship. And um, one of those um, teams proposed a business that's based on um, creating a genetically specific service animal. Um, 
I could explain more, but it was way beyond me to sort of follow the science of that um, at, at some points. But th there is a special way that they're breeding um, dogs that are becoming service animals and they're building a business around this for people who have PTSD and um, other sorts of mental illness. Um, so I think if you look for a problem like that, there are often things that are not technological that can be a real good innovative strategy to address them. Oh yes, um, of course for certain. Um, technology is uh, it's almost a, a tool when you eat, it's like a fork and a knife to cut your meat, but it doesn't mean you can't eat your meat without those two tools, so I um, uh, <laughs> couldn't find a better analogy. Um, so <laughs> definitely I'm um, a social entrepreneurship, I mean it's a, it's a boom, it's very creative ideas and, and students um, with their fresh mind um, very engaged on finding um, the problems to um, uh, solutions, or other way around solutions to problems, um, but also um, uh, serial entrepreneurs who just get bit by the bug, they, they want to change from being CEOs at the drug development company to doing completely something different, helping high school students to accelerate. Or, so uh, yes, definitely. Well, and you often see yeah. good design, the most challenging thing is to take the technology out. Right. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the easy path is to put the technology in, but the elegant and, uh, and really uh, profitable solution is the hard work it takes to take it out. Yeah. yeah, I mean, there has to be more ideas out there beyond technology that can produce revenue. You know, just look for the biggest problems. You know, there's billions of people that are thirsty in the world. You know, can we, can we solve that issue? Some of these are social issues, the biggest, biggest problems, um, you know, problems with families, you know, societal problems. You know, what kind of things can you develop that would bring families together, for example? Um, you know, the, the bigger the problem, the bigger the potential, but there's a whole lot more out there besides just technology. Yeah. Brad's got a great example in terms of clean water. Many of you have seen the life straw, right? Right. For, there's, for there's years, one. the yeah. world has pumped technology into the question mm -hmm. of clean drinking water until someone finally said, why do we need to make a lot of clean drinking water? Mm -hmm. Let's just make just a filter. simple way to drink dirty water. Better filter, right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so they took That's existing technology and put it in a straw, and there you have it, right? Mm -hmm. um, so uh, not, not a ton of new technology deployed, just a different mm -hmm. way of looking at the problem. If you're looking at building a team, an effective team, what kind of person or skill set do you think is most important? As the person building the team or the person to add to the team? The, the person who's got the team. And who's building? You're building a... I'd say humility would be step one. <laughs> <laughs> Being a team player, <laughs> I guess. Uh, mm -hmm. You, you think like a finance person or a, a technology person or a legal or what? Well, that's the village, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, just somebody with a lot of money helps. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and yeah, just. Uh, I, I heard an accountant is really important and nobody always thinks about it. Um, yeah, they can. Well, excuse me, Cliff, but. Um, He's our accountant, but um, I mean, sometimes you know you, you don't want to hear the the you know the the break-even point until you've you know really gotten further down the road with the idea. But you do need to know you know pricing and, and margin and those kinds of things pretty early, um, you know. But someone with a really great imagination, mm -hmm. a very creative person, um, someone who certainly has done it before, um, you know. Uh, designers, engineers, I think, are good to have on board early on. I, I mean, I, I think like you. No, so go ahead. I like to get a um, super critic. Yeah. So That's somebody that I think is going to be my internal idea breaker, and I like to have them <laughs> yes. there from yeah. the beginning. Yeah. I was thinking about your husband. Yeah. I mean, that was <laughs> answer, right? yeah. Get the person who's going to break your idea the fastest. He yeah. is the best idea breaker I've ever yeah. met. There you go. And, and those, you know, customers get get a get customers on board as soon as possible mm -hmm. yeah. that are going to be very honest with you and it you know it can't be your wife it has to be someone that's going to be brutally honest with you 
you know, my about husband. <laughs> why this won't work. Yeah. 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 Well, you need the users. I mean, long before you need to expend money on attorneys and accountants, you need to back into what what is the business opportunity mm -hmm. before you start to assemble a team to help you execute that type of business opportunity. So I think mm -hmm. I think you're all right. You've got to find yeah. someone to pressure test the idea. Yeah. And having a team, I guess too many people um, think they can do it all themselves. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, faculty included at times, because um, they learn to get their own grants, build up their own lab, do their own research. It's, it's, a, it's almost an isolating environment and, and, and uh, building a team, reaching out, knowing or having the humility to say, I don't know, I need help. I have never written a commercialization plan. Where should I start? Um, and I think the, this is a very important. I think from our own experience where we recently showed one of our, our pet projects to Brad and the folks in his company mm -hmm. and they very politely said, this is ugly. <laughs> 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 so you really need to be able to listen yeah. to someone who says your baby is ugly. <laughs> he didn't run away though. <laughs> Just a prototype. So. Yeah, yeah. He told yeah. us how to make it pretty. Yeah. <laughs> um, I guess I have time for two more questions. And one relates to um, intellectual property. What unique issues do you face when you're um, selling intellectual property or things that are maybe less tangible? products such as software I guess we have you as the expert for the office of technology yeah. Yeah. <laughs> transfer um. yeah. that's where I would call an attorney yes yeah, yeah, I would, and that's when we really call on our attorneys for that because it's very difficult to value a patent you know until it's been on the market um, or because you just don't know how it's going to do in five years, you know, ten years. Um, that's why we try to set up licensing agreements that will protect the inventor as well as Practicon. Mm -hmm. um, you know, with uh, you know, with ceilings and those kinds of things. Um, but that that's a hard one to value. Yeah, you know, just. Well, and, and you all have all had experience, and certainly Marty has as well. I mean, having that patent, having put your stake in the intellectual property landscape mm -hmm. is only a fraction of the question. The next yeah. question is, yeah. where are all the fences yeah. around you? Yeah. And, and, and where can you go from your point of yeah. departure? Yeah. The answer may be nowhere. And yeah. I, I think an important point to consider about patents is the cost associated with the patents. So mm -hmm. even mm -hmm. before having a patent, um, uh, these can cost whatever, 3000 to 15000 a year. I mean, this is a lot of money. Where is the return of investment? And once a patent is filed, the clock starts ticking. So even, um, I mean, just not even thinking the value of a patent itself is the mm -hmm. value that you actually have to put out in front before there's any return. I mm -hmm. think that's where, where really um, the education comes in on, on making the right steps. I mean, one question we often get is like, when should you file an invention disclosure? I mean, I think companies are a little more protective um, and you have more time to develop your idea um, to get a product out of it, whereas universities tend to file earlier, so they might need a bigger support system to develop this idea further. So um, I, I think these, even before going this route, some copyright is maybe different and trademark is, is even a, a step lower, but this is maybe my comment to this question. Very good. One last question. What have you done to encourage this innovation ecosystem in your sphere of influence. So I was talking about this this morning. I'm uh, I'm a convener. I like to bring people together and um, to say, here's a problem I'm aware of. You all have different kinds of expertise, different experiences to bring to bear on it. Go, and then to to let it happen. Um, and let that conversation build to a point that we've got some action plan in place. So I, I think that's one of my very favorite things to do is to convene people who know a lot about something and they care about addressing it and let them have that conversation. Very good. How about you, Brad? You're in industry. Yeah, that, that's a good one. Um, we have a link on our website that asks for new ideas. And if you go there, it tells you kind of how we handle new ideas. There's a non-disclosure agreement there that they can print out and sign. But we ask our customers for ideas and then 
once they contribute those, we nurture those and protect them like they're our own because you know that's the only way you're going to get more of them. Um, but Practicon, by definition, is kind of like a uh, innovative product company. We look for those kinds of things, and um, we just encourage dentists to send them to us, and then we often tell the story in our catalog of you know successful products brought to us by customers. Yes, yeah, so with the SBTDC, Small Business Technology Development Center, we assist businesses to grow. And we are actually in a fortunate position because clients come to us with all kinds of ideas and they want assistance. So I, I think my role, I like to listen to ideas, um, technology commercialization being my specialty, but uh, just always answering the emails, letting the client speak for a little bit, see what's going on and trying to to assist in, in either directing them to specialty programs, to general business consultants. Um, uh, we have international business development, um, we have contracting um, uh, programs, then we have the technology commercialization. So each day actually it's nice to see the emails and see what, what, what people want <laughs> and then to find solutions to those problems. I think I'd, I'd just to add a little another dimension to the conversation answer from a human perspective we deal with lots of different people from different situations different backgrounds different age groups and, and we certainly do a lot of infrastructure building and you know connecting and, and training and facilitating but I think a lot of times the answer to the question depends on who you're dealing with and how old they are. Um, there is a tremendous difference in taking a young person and, and what you, you tend to have to do to get them to unleash their creativity and what the approach you tend to have to take with an adult. And even there's differences amongst adults depending on what culture they come from or what background they come from. Um, so, you know, in general terms with young people, simply to know that they are going to be supported and empowered to take something from an idea to its manifestation, they get on board with that. Uh, adults, oftentimes it's showing them that there is a simple process that they can learn that tends to encourage them, although you generally have to be a little more forceful in, in kind of ripping the blinders off that they've spent a career building <laughs> along the sides of their forehead. So uh, it, it really, from a, from a human standpoint, you really need to think about uh, you know, who, who these people are and from what perspective they come from. Very good. Mm -hmm. Well, I appreciate um, you all being here today to, to shed some light on, on your, your kind of perspective of the innovation ecosystem and for the answers to really good questions. So please join me in thanking them for um, being here with us today. Mm. Well, and I wanted to also recognize our sponsor, one of our sponsors for, um, for the Idea to Impact program, and that is Mark Phillips with the North Carolina Biotechnology Center. Thank you very much, Mark. This has um, really made the program even better. The other sponsors include the uh, Division of Research and Economic Development and the Office of Innovation and Economic Development. Mm -hmm.